This morning we'll look at John chapter 20 verses 19 to 30 as we see Thomas, the doubting disciple, and ask ourselves, what certainty do we have about our faith? Jesus' cross makes us certain. The resurrection accounts make us certain. And we believe because Christ is risen. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to read just a portion of the gospel lesson that applies to our message today. We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus said, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You remember the words that were shouted just a little over a week ago. Crucify him. Crucify him. They were shouting out in the praetorium. The chief priests, the officers of the Jews, crying out to Pontius Pilate. Jesus was wearing a crown and a faded old purple robe standing before them. Pilate said to these officials, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Of course, Pilate was taunting the Jews, wasn't he? Because the Jews no longer ruled themselves and they could put no one to death except the Roman governor gave them permission and he found no fault. And Pilate's sarcasm, I imagine, cut very deeply into these leaders who had given him so much trouble. And the authorities finally admitted a little bit later that Pilate was right. Pilate's jest pointed to their lost sense of independence. They were enslaved, so to speak, once again. But ignoring the provocation, what took place? They said, we have a law, and by that law he makes himself out to be the Son of God. And here it was. Here was the real charge they were hiding from Pilate. Here it was. He claimed to be the Son of God. Blasphemy. The verdict against him was deserving of death. Caiaphas felt this was an insult to God and he wanted the man dead. He claimed to be the Son of God. And his claim was denounced and it was denied. Well, today the same thing goes on, nothing new under the sun, right? In our society in the 21st century America that we live in, the deity of Christ, the Son of God, is still being denied. In the front ranks of his accusers before Pilate, it was the leaders of the Jews, their officers, and their religious leaders. Well, who is it today? So culture and society, isn't it? Always making their attacks, always eager to discredit and undermine the love of God in Jesus Christ. But tax, these attacks don't only come from outside the church, do they? They even come from within the church, and these perhaps are the most scathing. People wandering around in all of the wonderful clerical garb and the great big pectoral crosses and the mitres and all of this. Sitting in seats of power, leading churches, sitting in universities and seminaries, undermining the deity of Christ. Telling us the eyewitness accounts of those who actually saw and believed are unreliable. 
They cry out today with those leaders and officers of the Jewish people. Crucify him. Crucify him. Because many clearly state and will not believe that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. They join the voice of Caiaphas today. And these are people who suppose themselves Christian leaders. How do you and I in this day and age deal with these things? You know, this is not a 1900s or 20th, 21st century sort of a trick that the devil has come up with. It has been around for years. It goes all the way back. Even when believers were waiting for the coming of the Messiah, the doubts and the questions were being put forward. But that's Satan, isn't it? Remember what happened at the tree in the garden? Did God really say? Did God really say? He plans the questions, he plans the uncertainties, he plans the doubts in people's minds. And sometimes like the disciples on Easter Eve or Easter morn when the women showed up, doesn't sound quite right, a little hesitant. Or maybe a week later like St. Thomas, when he had heard the risen Lord, had appeared to the disciples a little more obstinate. Not just doubt. I will not believe it, he said. Then he gave three reasons why he would not believe it. Three things, if it were true, that Jesus must do to prove it to him. He must seal the, see the prints of the nails. He must put his fingers into the nail marks. He must put his hand, oops, over here, into the side. He would not believe. Jesus appeared today to Thomas. Eight days after the resurrection, the next week, in that same room, locked doors, gathered together, and suddenly he's standing in the middle of the group. He hadn't been there before, but suddenly he was, just as the previous Sunday. And the same greeting comes to you and I and to the disciples that day. Peace be with you. Not just the Hebrew way to say hello, shalom, but a much grander, a much deeper, much fuller meaning that shalom, that peace is intended to mean. Peace be with you. In that word peace, it's not just a calmness of mind or spirit. It's not a sense of, I hope for world peace, but is the announcement of, of the peace that the Savior has attained for us with God the Father. The peace that comes through the cross. The peace that is ours because of faith and the forgiveness of our sins. Peace be with you. Why is it the first thing he does is to forgive their sins when he appears? Because of their lack of faith. He forgives their doubting, their uncertainty. He forgives them running in fear in the garden. He forgives them not being with him at the cross. He forgives all of their uncertainties. Peace be with you. Everything they've ever thought, said, or done that was at war with God is now washed clean in the blood of Christ. It does not exist. Peace be with you. And then he turns... He hadn't been there when Thomas arrived. He hadn't been physically present in the room. He couldn't possibly heard what Thomas had said. Or could he? For now the human body of Jesus associates with his divine attributes. And he is present, though not visibly seen, because when he comes back again, what does he do? He turns immediately to Thomas and he says, Thomas, put your hands here. Into the nail prints. Thomas, take your hand 
and put it here in my side. Feel the spears piercing the thrust. Stop doubting and believe. But the word here is not simply doubting. Stop your unbelief. Stop being so obstinate. Trust me. Believe. Lean on me. Rest in my arms. And Thomas is oh so familiar with Thomas's response. We don't know if he dropped to his knees or what he did, but he confesses now boldly, you are my Lord and my God. We might wonder why Thomas doubted like that. The same Thomas, when Jesus was determined to go back to Judea, said to the others, let us go with him that we may die with him. That kind of a bold, practical sort of faith. And now why the doubt? But you and I are also people of contradiction, aren't we? We've run into that before. And it's a real trial because you and I have not walked with Jesus or talked with Jesus. You and I have not witnessed the wonderful miracles that the scriptures and others outside of the Bible testify to. We believe without having ever seen because of the power of Christ's word. We believe and are certain without touching and feeling. The hidden God, the God who hides himself in creation, the God of mystery, finally comes to us in reality at the cross. It's at the cross that we see the secret God appear. And there we hear the words and the testimony. And there we see the salvation promised from the beginning of time. We know and we believe. Remember the miracles which pointed to the Christ. Remember what John said with the first miracle in Canaan. This was the first miracle which Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. And the disciples believed in him. And each one of the miracles that he did assured them that the word that he spoke, the word which was the focus of Christ's message, was certain and real. And yet, in the midst of conflict, doubt sometimes creeps in. But there upon the cross, there for all the world to see, we cannot undo it. It has been accomplished. We shouldn't be surprised that the world tries to deny Jesus, tries to undermine the certainty of faith that we have. Think of the 1940s. Eisenhower putting cameras into the German concentration camps because he knew that people would never believe it. There's video footage, films of all of this abuse and torment of these starved bodies and these piles of corpses. And yet today people say it never happened. How much more do they want to not believe the beauty of the salvation that is ours in Christ? Hebrews says to us, faith is the assurance of things not seen. That's what Jesus talks about today. He says to him, to Thomas and to us, peace be with you. Find peace in my promises. The risen Lord, who more than 500 people saw before his ascension into heaven, brings you and I the forgiveness of sins and hope in a dark and hopeless world. 
But that's all the glory of Easter, isn't it? And why he chose such frail vessels like you and I, we will never understand or fully comprehend. But in a way, it's good. It's good. Because of our frailty, because of our questions, God himself is glorified. And that's just as well because all glory goes to Christ. He plants that glory in his word. He brings that word to us at Christmas. He fulfills his word in the word made flesh at Easter. He has died and he has risen. So he's anxious that we get the word out. He comes to us in peace and says, peace be with you, your sins are forgiven. And then he strengthens our faith and says it again. And then he says it again and then he gives it to us to say to others so that they too might know the beauty and the assurance and the promises of God fulfilled in that cross. You and I in this troubled world are the light of that peace. That's even his message to Thomas now exclaimed in the power of that word in which Thomas confesses his faith. Through his word Jesus overcomes the uncertainties of our hearts and enables us, enables us to believe and to confess with Thomas, you are my Lord and my God. The peace of God bestows forgiveness of sins and life everlasting upon you. What blessed assurance that gives us in a world where he is the light and we are his reflection. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to hear more on this or any other topic, please find us on the web at emmanuelnrh.net. Please join us for worship Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., Bible class and Sunday school at 10.30 a.m.